In this video, we're going to discuss the expansion of the universe, the observations that led to its confirmation, and the implications for the overall geometry and structure. A little over a hundred years ago, observations were being made of objects in space that included their distances and the spectra of these objects. For example, the astronomer Vesto Slipher was observing what uh, astronomers were then calling the spiral nebulae. One thing that he found out was that the spectra of these objects were redshifted, that the absorption lines were redshifted from where they should be, and that the redshifts were so great, he deduced from this that they must be moving away from us at very great speeds. Today, we know that these objects are galaxies outside the Milky Way. And so here are some examples. If you look at a few different galaxies, you can look at the spectra. And one thing that was discovered a little bit later is that the bigger the distance, the bigger the redshift, and thus the bigger the speed of these galaxies away. That was determined by an American astronomer named Edwin Hubble, the astronomer who the Hubble Space Telescope is named after. He used, at the time, the biggest telescopes in the world to not only determine the distance to these uh, galaxies, but also their uh, spectra. What Hubble discovered is that the bigger the distance to a galaxy, the bigger the redshift, and thus the bigger the apparent velocity away. Hubble looked at dozens of galaxies, and he put together his observations, the observations of people like Vesta Slipher, and by 1929 had established that there is a linear correlation between distance and apparent recessional velocity of galaxies outside of our local group of galaxies. This was the first time that we had observational uh, confirmation that the large-scale structure of the universe changes with time. So since the days of Hubble, astronomers have been measuring distances and redshifts for galaxies, and every galaxy that's not part of our local group of galaxies has a redshifted spectrum, and it follows this Hubble relationship, what, what we call Hubble's law. And it goes like this. Velocity is proportional to distance, and you can make this an equality by having a scale factor or proportionality constant in the relationship. And so what we'll write down is velocity is equal to some constant times distance. Astronomers call this constant h, or the Hubble constant. If it varied with time, astronomers call it the Hubble parameter, but for right now, we're going to call it the Hubble constant for our local universe and the current moment of time. What we do know is that the Hubble's constant, or the Hubble parameter, turns out to be the expansion rate of the galaxies and the expansion rate of the space-time itself in which those galaxies are located. Expansion? You might be wondering, what do we mean by that? What does it mean for the universe and space-time to be expanding? This goes back to Einstein. Einstein was a physicist that revolutionized the field of physics multiple times in the 20th century. Not only did he lay the groundwork for some of our understanding of quantum mechanics, but he also developed two theories of relativity about 10 years apart. In 1905, he developed the equations of special relativity, and that describes how objects that move very fast, how they behave. And it also describes how space and time are related, that your motion through space affects your motion through time. And so those two things are interrelated. And we often now describe something called space-time. In 1915, Einstein published his theory of general relativity. And general relativity is a theory of gravity. And it's even bigger than that. It describes how space-time operates, how masses inside space-time affect space-time itself, and how it can be dynamic, how it doesn't have to be a static uh, set of locations in space and time. Space and time are intimately linked together. There are three dimensions of space. You can move forward and reverse, left and right, up and down, for example. Those are three dimensions that you can move through that are spatial. And then you're always moving forward through the time dimension. Your motion through space affects your motion through time. 
Those four things are interrelated. We describe space-time as being the linkage of these four things. So you can describe a location in space-time. In general, space-time is flat. However, if masses are in space-time, the mass will curve space-time so it's no longer flat in the vicinity of the mass. The curvature determines how objects or light or anything move through it. So there are fundamental differences between the picture of the universe that we call the Newtonian picture from Newton's gravity and Newton's physics and Einstein's version of gravity and space-time. In Newtonian physics, mass tells gravity how to exert a force on it, and the force tells mass how to accelerate. But in Einstein's formulation, we describe mass and energy together. You might have heard of the famous equation E equals mc squared, and that is a relationship that describes how mass and energy are actually equivalent, and there's a lot of practical applications to that. In any case, mass energy tells space-time how to curve around it, and the curvature in space-time tells mass energy how to move through it. Einstein's relativity has equations that describe a dynamic universe. Space-time doesn't have to be static. It can actually contract or expand with time, and Einstein's field equations and the geometry equations allow for this. In this model, what it means is galaxies aren't actually moving through space to give us the redshifts that we observe. They're moving with space-time as it expands, and that's giving us the appearance of galaxies moving away from us, when in fact all galaxies are moving away from uh, all, every other galaxy. We're moving away from them, and they're moving away from us, and all locations in space-time are expanding away from each other. You only notice this for the biggest distances in space. Within a galaxy, between the stars, you don't notice any expansion. Why is this? Because at those small scales, gravity is strong enough to hold the stars together, and so we don't see galaxies getting larger over time. Some of the implications of general relativity and the fact of expansion is this. Space-time between galaxies is expanding. We notice the galaxies expanding, and Another aspect of general relativity is that it allows for an infinitely large space. However, in an expanding model, you can have a finite age for the universe. And so even though the universe is finite in age, that is, it started at a mo moment in time and then has reached this point in our current history, it could still be infinite in size. Also, the expansion is happening everywhere and proportionally with distances. There's no center to the expansion. There's no one preferred place where the locations in space-time are moving away from. We think that the universe has an overall flat geometry to it. We don't think that the universe is curved in on itself or has negative or positive curvature. We think that it's overall flat. Here's an example of what I mean by the galaxies expanding away from each other proportionally. Here I have three galaxies, each separated by various distances, two, three, and five billion light years, respectively. If we expand the universe by two times in some set time, then all distances will get larger by two. And so the expansion happens proportionally for all galaxies. It doesn't matter which galaxy you are observing from, for example, the top right galaxy or one of the galaxies in the bottom of the figure, you'd notice the expansion everywhere you look. And it doesn't matter uh, which one you're looking from. There's no preferred center to this expansion.